One of my favorite restaurants in Seattle is this fancy little place in Greenwood called Gordito's, okay? And yeah, I, I might be exaggerating a bit on the fancy part of that description. Uh, Gordito's, which just this week, I realized what that means in Spanish. It means little fat ones. It's like, oh man, no wonder I like this place so much. It's what you would call, or at least what they would call, a healthy Mexican restaurant that serves burritos the size of babies. Okay, I kid you not. For years, I had heard stories of these giant burritos. I'd seen pictures online. I'd read the reviews, but it was a whole different story to finally go and experience Gordito's. And the moment you walk in the front door, okay, you know, like you know this place is serious. Like they're not messing around. There are pictures all over the walls of people laying their babies next to these giant burritos, like lay them on the tables next to these giant burritos. It's, it's fantastic, okay? And the menu, of course, it has all kinds of your typical Mexican restaurant menu items. And of course, there are all kinds of burritos, but there is only one thing that I ever order the burrito grande. And I just want to read you the first three words from the description on the menu because it just, it says it so well. Okay. The first three words are this, the baby burrito, <laughs> the baby burrito. Okay. Nothing can prepare you for the reality of that giant burrito being placed on the table before you. It's huge. It's healthy. It's so yummy. And thankfully for my sake, by, by the grace of God, it, it's far enough away from Burien that I just can't go there whenever I want. I can't just go anytime I feel like it. If I did, like Gordito or Gordito's would be a fitting description for the impact that would have on, on this body shape, or more so on this body shape. And today we're continuing in our series in the New Testament letter of Ephesians. And we're going to wrap up reading chapter 3. And that's, that's kind of a pivotal point in, in, the, in the letter of Ephesians. This letter is going to be broken into two halves. And this first half is, is chapters 1 through 3, which we're wrapping up in this message. And, and the focus has been on this sort of expansive story that God has been writing since before the creation of the world. And how that story, it finds its meaning in Jesus. And then how ultimately the, how that, that story resolves with, with God uniting right, all things, both in, both in heaven and on earth, in Jesus. And though that is, that is yet to be fully realized, that isn't something we are experiencing yet, God has begun this restoration process first in the church by uniting both Jews and Gentiles into this new people of God. Okay, and that's just a really long-winded of saying that these first chapters focus on the story of God. So we, we've got chapters 1 through 3, and now next week we're going to jump into chapters 4 through 6. And I'll just give you a bit of a preview, but there's going to be this shift from this more kind of theological, more thought-heavy to the more practical. Okay, how does this immense story of God, how does that intersect with our story, okay, with your story, with my story, our daily living, our families? our workplaces, our home churches. And yet, before we get there, the writer Paul, he concludes chapter 3, this chapter we're reading right now, with another prayer. And if you think back to chapter 1, Paul, Paul also included a prayer there. So it's almost like these two prayers are the bookends to this first section of the letter. And what that earlier prayer was, was for the Ephesian believers to know God intimately and experience his power. So that was that first prayer. Now this second prayer is that believers would know the power of Christ's love and experience that love for one another. If I could sum up this message today in a big idea, it would be this. God invites us to pray big. God invites us to pray big. I wish you all could experience the burrito grande at Gordito's. I mean, if you were to ask me for recommendations on a place to eat in Seattle, that's going to be the first place I'm going to tell you about. Those are going to be the first words out of my mouth. Okay, why? Well, I want you to experience what I've experienced. I want you to be wowed the same way that I've been wowed. I want you to taste this 
healthy Mexican food the way that I've tasted and received and enjoyed that. And my trying to describe this to you is similar to what Paul is conveying in this prayer that we're going to be reading today. He's trying to express how, how high and how, how wide, how deep is the love of God that, that he has experienced. He's praying that, that we would know that and that we would experience God's love in all of its fullness. Okay, why? Why does he want that for us? Well, because as we receive his love, it changes us. Okay, just as we have been shaped by the love of others in our life, whether a parent or a guardian, maybe a mentor, you know, a spouse, even kids and grandkids. So, so knowing God's love, like the way that he sees you, the way he sees me, his love on display in Jesus Christ, it has the power to mess with us in a good way. And Paul is on a mission to share that love because everyone, everyone needs to know the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus. So let's jump into this, this passage. And we're going to start reading in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. There is a lot to take away in these words of prayer and praise from Paul. But I just want to highlight sort of a few things here and how we should think about prayer. So, so the first thing, how should we think about prayer? The first thing is this prayer requires humility. Okay, right at the, at the beginning of this prayer, we see that Paul is praying, it says here, on his knees. And that's a sign of humility. Okay, that was not a typical Jewish way to approach God. Yet, in times of desperation, like all, all of the sort of norms can go out the window. And I think of the story that Jesus tells of both the religious leader and a tax collector that both come to sort of pray in the temple. They come to, to seek out God. And the, and the tax collector specifically, it says that he came in desperation. He came broken, praying on his knees and, and beating his chest. And that's like Paul. That's what he's describing. That's like Paul in these opening words. He, he has a desperation here that these people, these Ephesian believers at the church in Asia Minor would truly know the love of God. Okay, a second way we should see prayer from what Paul is saying here. Prayer has a global scope. Okay, too often we can kind of be trapped into praying too small right? and, and mainly just praying for ourselves. And I can't tell you how often I fall into that pattern of praying. And before you, you think, no, there's nothing wrong with bringing our needs to God. He, he longs for us to come to him with those things. But but his love is also, it's for the world, right? What is John 3, 16, right? The most famous verse in the Bible. What does it say? It says, for God so loved, what? The world. Okay, it's important for us not only to pray personal prayers, but also big prayers. And verse 15 talks about God the Father. It says, as the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And I want to read this in another translation because I think some, some other translations have tackled this and translated it a bit better. So let me read this again, verses 14 and 15 for you out of the NIV. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. God is the true Father, from whom every family derives its name. And if you look at the Greek here, the original language this was written in, the, the phrasing is kind of funny and redundant. It, it kind of literally would be saying the father from whom all fatherhood derives its name. And it's a bit of wordplay from the, the writer Paul. The Greek word for father is the word pater. And the word for family is patria. Okay, these are sort of similar sounding words that kind of point to this major truth. Okay, God is a source of every family. He's the father from whom all fatherhood, right? Every family, every people, Every ethnicity, every culture derives 
its name. And in ancient times, the, a name was thought not just to be a way of sort of distinguishing one person from another, but it was also this means of revealing kind of the inner being, the, the true nature, who someone truly was. See, every family is made in the image of God, and he longs for all to receive his love. A third way we should see prayer based on these words from Paul is this, the Holy Spirit fills and empowers us as we pray. So Paul's first actual prayer request doesn't show up until verse 16, where he prays that God from his glorious unlimited resources would empower followers of Jesus with inner, inner strength through the Holy Spirit. And the power that Paul is talking about here, it's not a physical strength. You know, we don't grow stronger in the natural sense. Okay, that'd be nice. But again, right, the battle we engage in here, it's spiritual. It's, it's largely un, unseen. And Jesus talked about this empowerment from the Spirit in the New Testament book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Spirit has come to empower believers for God's mission. Okay, This power is not something we receive simply just to enjoy it to ourselves, but it's, it's a power that, that sends us out. And that's what we talked about throughout our commission series. If you missed any of that, it's a series we did before this. I would encourage you to go back and watch that. It's what we talked about there, but it's also what the book of Acts records. The, the Spirit of God filling the people of God. And, the, and then the movement of that, of, of the church from, from the upper room in, in Acts 2 in Jerusalem to across the known world by the end of the book of Acts. And, and that same power is available to you and to me today. It's not something God did for just a certain time and, and now it's gone. No, it's, it's why Paul continues to pray for the Ephesians to experience his power. And then that connects to, to us. It connects to you, Oasis. See, God longs to fill us with his love so that we can be a window display to the world around us. And then that leads to the, the fourth and final way we should see prayer based on these words from Paul. See, prayer unites believers in the love of Christ. Paul continues this prayer for spirit empowerment by connecting this to, the, to this inner strength to Christ residing in our hearts. You see, the same spirit that was in Jesus, the power and presence of God that, that he carried, it now resides in you and me by the Holy Spirit. Okay, don't miss that. Okay, the night before Jesus was crucified, in, in the gospel account of John, there's recorded a prayer that Jesus prayed for you and for me, uh, for his followers. And so let me read this out of John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will be ever believe in me through their message. Okay, that's us. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. You see, Jesus' prayer for, for you and for me is that we would be one. Right? We'd be united as followers of Jesus. Just as Jesus and, and, and God the Father, they're, they're one, so he longs for us to be one with them. You say, well, how is that even possible, right? How can we be in that? And, and the Spirit of God, that, that's what it is. It's the Holy Spirit that unites us with Christ. He fills our hearts with every spiritual blessing like we read in Ephesians 1 and, and empowers us. He empowers us for God's mission. And that kind of unity, Jesus says, it will speak to the world around us. Paul talks about Christ making his home right in our hearts. This is something God longs to do for us as, as home churches, as the church, capital C, that we would be rooted in God's love, that we would be united as a renewed and reconciled people of God. I mean, Paul, he's, he's praying something fierce over the Ephesian believers, but there's more. Let's keep reading in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. These are powerful words of prayer. 
that you and I would have power to get our hands around just, just how big the love of God is, that we could see it right in all its dimensions. And, and that reminds me of some, new, some newer technology that is super helpful when it comes to buying furniture. When you're shopping and using your phone, uh, some of the apps have this feature called View in My Room. And basically it scans a space that you want to place a piece of furniture and then it, in real time it superimposes that onto the screen. So you can see that couch, that entertainment console, that dining room table in your actual space. And it's not an exact science, okay? Sometimes your furniture looks like it's floating over the floor or it's kind of sideways, but the thought behind it is ingenious. Okay, it allows you to grasp the width, the length, the height, and depth of an item. And I wish we had that feature uh, when we ordered our fridge and we moved into the church parsonage. I, I would have quickly realized that there was no way it was going to fit through our entryway. But could, could you imagine that kind of ability when it comes to grasping the love of God? Okay, there's no app that could fathom the immensity of that kind of love. But that's exactly what Paul is praying for us here. That we could somehow, even though it's too great to fully understand, that we could somehow have power to see the love of God in our lives. Right? See how it works in our space. And that kind of knowledge, as Paul says here, listen, he said, that would, what would help us come to grips with the fullness of God. We would be complete because we know how he sees us, right? That kind of love has the power to change us. And again, Paul, he's praying big prayers, right? Imagine if God answered this. <laughs> and Paul, he knows in, in some ways this is beyond him. It's beyond you and me, but it, it doesn't stop him believing and asking in prayer. And theologian John Stott, he, he views Paul's requests in this prayer as sort of like a, a staircase, okay, growing more grand with every step. Right? He prays first that, that we might be strengthened by the indwelling of Christ through the Spirit. And then the second, right, that, that may be, we may be rooted and established in love. Then third, that we may know Christ's love in all its dimensions, although it is beyond our knowledge. And then, and then fourth, right, that we may be filled right up to the very fullness of of God. Okay, th this passage encourages us to seek a deeper knowledge, a deeper experience of God's power, love, and presence. Okay, it opens our eyes to the untapped potential of God's power in us, inspiring us to live for the praise of God's glory in new and bold ways. Hey, let's finish reading the last two verses of chapter 3. We'll pick up in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen, right? That's how we want to receive that. Paul, he's finished this prayer for the Ephesians. Now he sort of shifts to a closing doxology. You say, well, what is that? What is doxology? Well, it's a fancy way of saying words of praise and adoration to God. Now, you may have heard someone share these words at the closing of a service before. And even though Paul's staircase prayer it includes requests that are in some ways mysterious, right? How could we ever think of being made complete in this fullness of God, right? This side of heaven, receiving all that. Like I'm definitely, I know I'm definitely not worthy of receiving that kind of understanding. I probably explode. Yet, yet Paul reminds us here, right, that that God is, a, is able, right? He's able to do more, to accomplish more, infinitely more than we might ask or think. You see, this is an invitation for us to pray big prayers. And I want to read a quote from one of my devotionals, actually on prayer from this last week. And this is by Sky Jathani. He said this, Prayer is the conduit between our head and our heart. It is a catalyst that changes mere knowledge into love and love into action. And that's what I desire for us, Oasis. That we would pray big prayers. That God would move these words from, from our heads to our hearts. Right? We wouldn't settle for merely just head knowledge, but to love, and then love to action. And I sense as a church that we are kind of at a pivotal point in the story that God is writing. 
in our home churches. We are kind of at this pivotal point and we need God to break through. So over the month of August, on Monday through Thursday, I want to challenge you to pray big prayers for our church, for your home church. And each week we're going to have different themes. This is kind of the themes we're looking at. Week one, the theme is going to be our home churches, that we would know the love of God, that we would be filled to the fullness of God. And then week two, again, I kind of thinking of maybe a stair-step approach is multiplication. Would God bring more harvesters into the field? Would he draw by his spirit more leaders, more expressions of church? Would, we, would he draw ministry partners into our building? And then week three, we want to pray for our community. Like what needs are present here? How can we stand in the gap for Burien, Des Moines, Kent, Thunderway, Seattle, this, this, this region in general? And then the last fourth week, we want to pray for our ministry opportunity. Is that community dinners? Where, where are there gaps that God is calling us to meet the need? And if you didn't have time to catch all that information, don't worry, okay? I'm going to send out an email tomorrow with all that info. There'll be posts on Facebook. We'll discuss this in our home church services. You're going to know. You'll know what's going on as we focus on prayer over the next four weeks. And you can choose to pray, you know, when and where you sense God is leading you to. But if you desire to pray with others, okay, I will be praying at the building, at the church building between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. on Monday through Thursday. And I just want you to know you're welcome to join me any of those days for as long as you want. You don't have to stay the whole time. But I just want you to know if that is something you want, I'm going to be here. But I just want to challenge us, Oasis. Let's pray big prayers, knowing who we are praying to. And as I wrap up this message, I have just a few next steps for us. And the first is become a follower of Jesus. Have you received the love of God that is on full display in Jesus Christ? It's there for each and every one of us who are made in the image of God and we receive our name from him. Paul's prayer here is not just for then and there, right? It's also for you and it's for me today. And if you long to experience God's love in a real way, to receive inner strength from his spirit, it starts with receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. He's come to make us one, not just with each other, but also close to God, to bring us into his renewed and reconciled people. If that's you today, would you let someone in your home church know? We would love to pray for you and help you take next steps in what it means to follow Jesus. Another next step is this, experience the love of Christ. The Apostle Paul models for us a way of approaching God in prayer. And I think it's so fascinating to read the prayers of others. And I think there's something for us to gain from that. It made Paul's desperation for the Ephesians to experience the love of God rub off on your prayers. God longs for you to experience his love more fully, to, to plumb the depths and to stretch for the heights of his love for you that is in Jesus. You're never going to fully reach the completion of that pursuit in this side of heaven. But let's not be satisfied with what we've known. There's more. So would you pray this week to experience God's love in a new and deeper way? And when we experience that love, right, it has the power to change us. And that ties in well to our, our last next step. A pray big prayers. And this is my heart for us, Oasis. Okay, no more safe prayers. No more softball type prayers that God doesn't really need to intervene for them to be answered. Let's pray big prayers. Okay, let's pray knowing we have a God who is able right, to do exceedingly, abundantly, mucho grande burrito more than we could ever ask or imagine. Okay, this week our prayer focus will be for our home churches. Okay, not just your home church, but our collective home churches. They pray that we would know the love of God, that we might somehow be filled to the fullness of God. You can even choose to pray through Paul's prayer every day this week and insert oasis every time Paul says you in these words in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. I know in my heart that God is up to great things and breakthrough is there for the taking. So let's, let's pray big prayers knowing that we have a God who is able to go beyond, above and beyond what we could ask or imagine. 
I mean, let's be desperate for God to fill us with his love, like in this letter. Knowing that kind of love has the power to transform our hearts, our home churches, our community, and our world. God bless Oasis.